Uh, today we are going to talk about uh, the topics of uh, principles of both FMI. I assume that not all of you have the background about the MRI or specifically the functional MRI. So today I'm going to spend uh, around maybe two hours talk about the principle of the body MI. Uh, today's course will separate into two parts. The first part, we will talk about the physiology behind the neural activity. What kind of the vascular response will happen uh, in, in response to uh, this kind of neural activity? This is the first part we are going to talk about. And then in the second part, we will talk about the imaging technique, MRI how we can use uh, MRI or functional MRI to probe this kind of the vascular response. Okay, how can we imaging uh, this kind of the uh, physiological response uh, to the neural activity? Okay, so we will separate our course into these two different parts. Uh, so as you may recall that this is the general idea about this semester. We will introduce uh, several different kinds of the image analysis techniques, but today we will start from this very uh, original point. How can we uh, acquire this kind of the both signals? What does this uh, both signal represent? So in this part, uh, we are talking about physiology of neural activity. We know that if we can do something, for example, uh, do the mental calculation, 1 plus 1 equals 2, and uh, we can do some other tasks like uh, grasp a pen or just uh, keep something balanced. We can do all these kind of um, tasks only because we have our brain. This is the organ that can give the command to our muscle or to coordinate our body movement. So this is the origin the neuron cell. This is a region for the uh, neuronal activity. To know how uh, this kind of a neural activity uh, work in our brain, we need to start from very, very basic uh, physiology. So first of all, we need to learn this term, membrane potential. Um, in our brain, uh, actually in all kinds of the cell, we can uh, observe this kind of the um, membrane potential. But particular to our uh, neuronal cell, the membrane potential is actually uh, around, I think, in the negative 40 to negative 80 mV voltage. This is the, uh, the actual number in our neuronal uh, cell. And in, in the human neuronal cell, it's around the negative 70 uh, mV. It's kind of the uh, number you should memorize. And why there is kind of the negative uh, potential in our membrane is actually because the different concentration of the ions. In, in the uh, space of the extracellular space right here, actually we have more uh, this kind of, we say Na or we say sodium, uh, sodium ion. And also we have the, this Cl, okay. So this kind of the uh, ion has uh, have more higher concentration in the extracellular space. But in the intracellular, that means inside of your uh, neuron cell, actually we have more potassium uh, uh, ion in our intracellular space. And this kind of the gradient, when we say gradient, that is the difference of the concentration uh, from uh, between two spaces right here. This kind of gradient create this kind of the negative uh, membrane potential in, uh, in our brain. So this is the I, we will call this is the balance or this is a nature state that normally we will have uh, you can simply memorize these two things we have more sodium outside and we have more potassium inside uh, your cell and we have a kind of a structure uh, called the ion channel ion channel is kind of the pathway or the gate that the ion can pass through or go through your membrane. It cannot directly go through your membrane, but simply it needs this kind of the ion channel. So specific uh, ions may need a specific kind of the ion channel. Okay, for a normal normal situation or a natural situation, this kind of the gate is closed. That means nothing going or nothing go outside. This kind of the balance. Okay, but in particular situation. Uh, this kind of ion channel may open and uh, land 
this kind of ions diffuse. Diffuse means uh, that the ions will go from the high gradient uh, space to the low gradient space. Just like the water, it will flow from the high level place to the low level place. We call this kind of the um, concentration difference is kind of a gradient from high to low, okay? So once the ion channel opens, uh, follow the gradient, ions may come into, for example, we say that we have more concentration or higher concentration of the sodium outside your cell. So once the ion channel open, the sodium will naturally come into your cell because it, it, here is a higher level, there is a lower level. So follow the gradient, the sodium will come into your cell. And again, if there is a kind of the potassium ion open right here, ion channel open right here, then the potassium will come outside the uh, cell. So this is called the ion channel. It's kind of the uh, just a gate. Once it's open, you don't need to uh, expand any energy. The ion will uh, simply follow the gradient. But there is a, another kind of the uh, gate we call the pumps. Pumps is a channel, but it consumes the energy. It actually needs the energy to do something that normally transport the ions um, reversely against the gradient. So if you want to um, actually uh, transport the sodium, normally once the gate open, it will come into the uh, cell, intracellular space right here. But once you want to uh, send or transport all the uh, sodium, go back to its original place, you need this kind of the pumps. It will, uh, it will need the energy. In our body, the energy is in such kind of the ATP form. Uh, adenosine triphosphate is kind of the energy form in our body. It will um, need this kind of ATP, then we can reversely uh, transport the sodium against the, the natural gradient. So this kind of the pumps, particularly we call the sodium potassium pump, is actually, there is a, a slogan actually in Chinese, it's kind of the uh, slogan in Chinese, but in English we say three, three sodium out of the cells and it brings two potassium into uh, the cells. It's kind of the uh, function of these kind of pumps. So do remember that this kind of a pump demands ATP, okay. So this is two different, two different way. One way allows some ions in, but uh, another way you can you need the ATP and uh, you can let particular uh, ions send out or send in uh, to the uh, cell level. Okay. And every single time we say neural activity, actually we are uh, talking about the action potential. Once the uh, neuron is doing something, we say it may induce or generate a so-called action potential. It's kind of the form uh, of the neural signal, neuronal signal. So if we want to um, send a message from one cell to another one, so-called action potential will be generated. So there is a, a several step or several segment of this kind of the action potential. They have several uh, steps right here. We can simply um, separate this kind of signal into two parts we call depolarization. And another part is more like a recovery part we call repolarization. Okay, we have, uh, there are two different parts uh, of this the action potential. But first of all, we need to uh, remember this point. Action potential, the generation of action potential is uh, following a rule we call the all or none potential, uh, principle, all of none principle. Uh, action potentials are said to be O or non signals because they occur fully or they do not occur at all. There is kind of a stress hole. For example, once uh, the uh, member potential from um, maybe change from the negative 70 to more like the positive one. For example, once you have the member potential uh, changes from the negative 70 to become maybe negative 40, then the action potential will proceed, will generate into its uh, full form right here. But if you only have the membrane potential changes from maybe negative 70 to maybe negative maybe 60, then nothing will happen. It's kind of the threshold right there. For example, the threshold right here is negative 55. Okay, it's kind of the uh, threshold you, you need to generate the full form of the action potential. 
once this kind of a threshold is reached, that means the action potential uh, becomes uh, more positive than the uh, negative 55, then depolarization will happen. The depolarization actually opens the ion channel that the sodium ions uh, can naturally, following the uh, gradient, moves into the axon or moves into the intracellular space. Okay. And because more uh, positive ions moves into the ce uh, cells, then the um, potential within the cell becomes more positive. Okay, so it will uh, change the value from more negative value, and with more positive ion, it will come to the, maybe I, I think it can be uh, as high as the positive 40, okay? So there is a peak, this peak we call the action potential, maybe it's just around the positive 40. And after this kind of the peak value, there is some recovery phase we call the repolarization right here. In this kind of things, we say, okay, in this part, uh, the potassium channels, ion channel will open. Remember that the potassium uh, concentration is higher within your cell. So now, if you want to restore restore the, uh, the membrane potential to more negative part, then you allow, you allow more positive ion like the potassium. Just leave the cell, just go outside the cell. So this is the, uh, the timing that uh, the ion channel of potassium open right here. So these are two different kind of ion channel. One is for sodium. Uh, sodium is well more re related to the depolarization, and another one, potassium, is more related to the repolarization. And of course, after uh, all this happened, you can see now the concentration distribution of the sodium and the pot uh, potassium is totally different from the nature uh, nature state, right? Normally, the uh, sodium should be higher level in out outside the cell, but after this kind of uh, uh, a generation of the action potential. Now, within the cell, we have more sodium. And uh, once uh, the repolarization is done, we have more potassium outside the cell. So we need to restore this kind of uh, things. Just try to reverse all the uh, concentration back into the natural state. So we need so-called sodium and potassium pumps to uh, reversely transport all the sodium back into their original uh, place. Okay, and once the action potential generate, you can see the signal will actually um, transfer, uh, tra transport or transfer from the uh, cell body end to the so-called synapse end. Okay, synapse end. However, we know synapse is kind of a structure that connect, not really contact with each other, but there is a gap between uh, between two uh, neuronal cells. Actually, between the uh, one end is the axonal end of previous um, neuronal cell, and another one is the dendrite end of the next neuronal cell. And there is a very, very small gap right here that there is no direct contact between these two kinds of the axon and the uh, dendrite right here. So how can we induce the action potential for the next uh, neuronal cell? There is a, a very important thing we call the neurotransmitter. Neurotransmitter is kind of the uh, chemical reagent that we can actually uh, induce or evoke the action potential uh, for the post synapse area right here. Okay, so before we introduce in t detail, we need to learn uh, several terms right here. First of all, the glutamate. Glutamate is one of the most important neurotransmitter in our uh, neuronal system. Actually, this is a, a kind of the excitatory uh, neurotransmitters. That means if you release the glutamate from the presynapse uh, position right here, then it will induce the action potential for the post-synapse region right here. Okay, And there is another one we call the GABA. This is kind of the inhibitory neurotransmitter. That means if you release the GABA from the presynapse part to the post-synapse it will actually inhibit any uh, possibility to in, uh, to generate the action potential for the uh, post-synapse area right here. So this is kind of the 
as a reader and the brake system, just two different kind of a neurotransmitter work just uh, like the antagonist or something that uh, normally just one induces the excitation, one will induce the inhibition. Oh, it's two different things. Okay, so there is a term that uh, that is uh, associated with the glutamate. We call it EPSP, excitatory uh, post synaptic potential that is induced by the glutamate. And another one we call IPSP, inhibitory post-synaptic potential, that is induced by the GABA. So there are two different uh, uh, scenarios right here. Okay, so now in the following maybe three slides, I'm going to zoom in these um, pictures right here so we can look into the detail how uh, this kind of neurotransmitter uh, will function on this kind of synapse structures. So first of all, you can see once uh, one of the neural cells generate, generate the action potential as we mentioned before, then how can we uh, really conduct this kind of action potential to the next axon or to the next uh, neuronal cell? Actually, it will come to the synapse part right here. So as you can see right here, once there is an action potential travels down to the synapse part right here, it will actually uh, cause the calcium channel open. We said action potential generated from the uh, neural, neural cell end will depolarize. Please remember that depolarization or depolarize, de that means uh, to initiate or to start uh, a new event for, uh, for something, for example, action, poten action potential or to uh, open a gate. For in this example, to open the calcium, calcium uh, ion channels right here. So the calcium will come inside to the synapse uh, within, within the cell, uh, to the synapse part right here. So open the channel and the calcium, actually the gradient is from outside to inside, and it will, it will come into the uh, synapse part. And once the calcium ions come into the synapse, it will actually combine with the, uh, the physical. This physical is the uh, circular structure right here, you can see. Uh, several circular structure right here. It contains the neurotransmitter, or we say store the neurotransmitter. So we can take the glutamate as the example that it stores within the uh, physical right here. And once the calcium come into and uh, uh, function on this kind of the physical, it will uh, drive the physical to the uh, to the synapse gap right here. So it will actually move the physical to this edge or to the boundary area right here. So the uh, physical will actually fuse, fuse with the presynaptic membrane. So you can see this is the isolated physical, but once it moves to the edge right here, it will fuse. The physical will fuse with the presynaptic membrane right here. So with this kind of a fusion, the neurotransmitter will be released into the synapse, the gap, the gap right here, okay? And uh, finally, this kind of the uh, neurotransmitter will bind with specific receptor. For glutamate, you will have the glutamate receptor right here. Well then open, again, open the uh, sodium, sodium's ion channel right here. So again, the sodium will flow into the post-synapse cell. So it will cause the depolarization happens again for the post-synapse area right here. So this kind of the mechanism will allows you to uh, Trans transfer or to uh, transport the neuronal signal from one end to another end through this kind of a mechanism. So you can see that the neurotransmitter right here is kind of the agent that not really cause the depolarization, but actually open the sodium ion channel, allows the new uh, action potential generated for the postsynaptic cells right here. Okay, so once the neurotransmitter like glutamate uh, finish his mission or finish its mission, we need to recycle, recycle the neurotransmitter so we can use this later on. So this kind of a, uh, glutamate is not, you know, the one use things. It actually will be recycled, reused for several times. Of course, in different form, once you, the glutamate finishes its function, it will uh, become another form we call the glutamine. And we need to again, transfer the glutamine back to the glutamate so it can act like a uh, neurotransmitter, okay? So you can see that 
which kind of neurotransmitter is released from the presynaptic uh, area is the critical point because if you release the uh, glutamate, it definitely will cause the we, we, we say the excitation for the post uh, post synaptic cells. But if it release the GABA, of course, it will uh, induce the so-called inhibition or IPSP uh, for the post synaptic area. So now we know that the uh, neural activation or action potential is a very first step for uh, neuronal function. But what would happen? What would happen uh, after uh, this kind of a neuronal signal happen or neuro neural activity happens? Actually, we need energy. Well, when I describe the uh, the scenario of the neural activity or action potential, actually we don't need the uh, energy at all. Actually, but once everything happened, we need to restore everything. Like I said, we need to use the sodium potassium pumps to restore the sodium and uh, potassium gradient. Also, we need to recycle or reuse the neurotransmitter. So actually, after the uh, neural ac activation happened, we need ATP or energy, okay, to restore these two things or to recycle these things. Okay, this is the key point right here. So actually, energy demands happened after the generation of the neural activity. Okay. So how can our body uh, generate this kind of energy? Actually, through t two different two different uh, mechanisms right here. But the majority uh, is from this part. We call it oxidative glucose uh, metabolism. This is, I think, over 90% of the energy generated in your brain is through this kind of a process. And this one is actually kind of the backup system. Once you don't have the oxygen or you don't have the glucose, that means maybe you have uh, some kind of vessel stenosis or occlusion, there is no blood that can send into your brain. Then your body will initiate or activate this kind of a process we call uh, glycolysis. This is a bad thing, actually. This is a bad, bad thing in your brain because if you try to generate ATP through these kind of things, that means first you don't need uh, you don't need oxygen, but you can only get a very small amount of the ATP. Actually, just two unit of ATP. But through the normal process that normally is con uh, consume the um, uh, I think the oxygen and the glucose through this kind of process, you can generate I think 34 units of the ATP. It's a very huge amount of the energy. But if you don't have the blood supply or oxygen supply, sufficient uh, supply right there, it will go through the glycolysis right here. It will produce so-called lactic. It, uh, it is some kind of the things that your brain cannot you know, just um, send it away. It will accumulate in your brain and cause extra damage. So it, lactic is kind of the sign, the biomarkers that we can say your brain may uh, in so-called uh, uh, ischemic state or something that they, there is no sufficient um, oxygen in your brain. It's kind of a, uh, I think, near death state that uh, definitely you need uh, the, the clinical doctors need to do something to uh, try to save your brain or something. So this one is a regular or the normal process that our brain normally used, but again, it definitely need the so-called oxygen and glucose. We need these two things to generate more ATP. But how our brain can um, obtain this kind of the nutrition, I mean, uh, the oxygen and glu glucose? Definitely through the uh, blood supply, through your, your vessel system. That means your heart need to pump out blood and into your brain. And through the respiratory process that you can keep uh, obtain the, the new oxygen and also when you eat something you can obtain this kind of glucose form so combine glucose and oxygen your brain can normally generate the uh, energy we say a huge amount of energy to take care or to support the new activation in your brain okay so we say the actually the cerebral metabolism or neural activation depends highly depends on a constant supply uh, of glucose and oxygen. You need both of them and your brain can work so, uh, properly or uh, very well. Okay. So here is the uh, actual process how we generate the energy right here. You can see if you only have the glucose without the oxygen you can uh, obtain the two ATP right here 
through the glyco uh, glycolysis right here. However, you will have some end product with uh, two units of the lactate. It's a bad thing. It's a bad thing. Only when your brain are in some kind of aero anaerobic uh, state, then you, you will go for this process. But normally, if you have glucose, and also you have the oxygen right here, you can just finish it, all kind of the reaction right here and to generate the 34 ATP right here. And without the production of the uh, lactate, it's uh, the normal way in your, in your brain. So I try to give you a general idea about the energy budget. Not, not the uh, financial budget, but actually the energy budget. When we need to uh, generate the new activity, what kind of energy we are going to uh, uh, need for this kind of a process. So actually you can see, um, actually there are around 22% energy is consumed for uh, the action potential or specifically to restore restore the membrane potential after the uh, neural activation. Okay? And also you can see right here the synaptic transmission that we need 64% uh, uh, energy right here. There are some supporting neuronal cell right here, the we call the glio, glio cell, that it will also consume around the three percent, three percent energy right here. Okay. And then here is the resting potential is around eleven potential eleven percent right here. So you can see once we we aim to uh, generate the neuro, neuro, neuronal activation or neural activity, it actually consumes very huge amount of the energy like over 86%. Of course, this kind of the data is not that easy to obtain from the human brain. So actually, this data is obtained from uh, the red study, not from uh, brain red. But uh, we, we can say that we may have a similar uh, pattern of the energy comp consumption between human and brain. It's kind of the reference that you can think about. OK, so not only recycle the glutamate, actually, we also need to restore the casein. Casein flux. Remember that the action potential from the uh, axon is actually uh, induce the opening of the casein ion channel. So all the casein uh, flow from the extracellular space into the cell. But actually, we also need to restore this kind of the gradient right here. So there are so many uh, uh, different things that demand energy in your brain once the synapse uh, synaptic transmission uh, happened. Okay. And also, we say we need to uh, restore the memory potential right here. Even you do not think, even your brain are uh, in some kind of the low energy state, for example, sleep, they still uh, need to maintain, in a very minimal level, they still need to maintain your uh, the basic neural, neural function in your brain. So here is the um, basic supply, around 14% uh, of the energy bar right here. So this is the, uh, the general picture for you to understand that why our brain demands the, the, the energy, or why our brain demands the glucose or the food. Uh, it's very important things right here. And uh, now we know that energy demands come after, uh, comes after the neuronal activity. But uh, this kind of the natural process or the physiological process uh, give us a hint. There's a very important uh, thing in our brain we call neurovascular coupling. Neuro means uh, ne ne neuronal activity or neuronal activation, but vascular means that your uh, vessels, your arteries try to give the sufficient supply, like the, uh, like the glucose and the oxygen, into your brain. So you can support the energy consumption in your brain. So we call Neurovascular coupling is a very essential issue that we can use to probe the, uh, the neuronal activity. If we don't have a way like the EEG or MEG that we can directly measure the uh, changes of the uh, potential in your brain or in your uh, neural cell, we can try to probe this part. If we cannot see here right directly, we can try to find a way to measure or to investigate the vascular response. This is another issue. Actually, this is the uh, this is the principle of the bold FMI. We didn't, we can't actually probe the, the neural activity. Instead, we are measuring the vascular response using the FMI. So do not, in some uh, in some literature or in some papers, they always say that we use FMI to observe 
the neural activity. Or they say, we use fMRI to measure the neural activity. It's wrong description. You are not allowed to say so because the principles of MI is not working this way. Actually, we can only probe the, the fanciful response. And we definitely need this coupling exist that so-called neural activity can induce the fanciful response. So we call this very important coupling as the neural vascular coupling. Okay. So this kind of the fanciful response uh, after the neural activity can be produced or can be generated uh, from multiple different mechanisms. For example, there is kind of the uh, neural cell in your brain we call the astrocytes. It may actually just link with the uh, neurotransmitter activity. So once the uh, action potential and the uh, synapse uh, event happens, it will also cause the physical response. So you can see the uh, plot right here. You can see here is the astrocyte. Once so-called synapse event happen, it will also cause the, you know, the downflow, downflow blood vessel to have some kind of a response. For example, the facial dilation. Facial dilation allows more blood to come into your brain. Okay, so this is kind of the uh, mechanism, one of the mechanisms. And there is another theory that is uh, saying maybe the neural uh, neuron cell have a direct innovation to the smooth muscle of the vessels. So these two kinds of mechanism can cause or can uh, induce the vascular uh, respond to this kind of neural activity. So this is the essential point that based on the requirement of the metabolic nutrition. Of course, the glucose and the oxygen. And also, there is a very important way that a vascular response is not only bringing more uh, blood supplies, but also it will help you to uh, eliminate the waste products. For example, CO2, definitely, and uh, some uh, extra heat in your brain. So you need to also bring out all the waste from your brain so your brain can uh, work uh, uh, properly. Okay. And we say uh, in our brain, actually, if you have a way, actually, this is kind of the uh, post-mortem uh, technique that actually fixed all the vessels in your brain, so you can really see see uh, see this. Actually, this this is a work that done in done done in uh, 1998. You can see that there is a very very dense, very very uh, uh, complicated vascular systems in your brain. So actually, this kind of a system will ensure that your brain will get sufficient blood supply. Okay. So we say that. A continuous supply of energy substrates is maintained by CBF. CBF, the full name of CBF is cerebral blood flow. Only the blood continuously come into your brain, your brain can keep uh, working well. Okay, so this is very important. CBF is kind of the index that is showing your brain can work properly right here. So of course the uh, nutrition, I mean the glucose or uh, oxygen, is actually transfers in the capillary space right there. Okay, so there are several different markers. One is the uh, cerebral blood flow, or sometimes we add an R right here. We say regional, regional cerebral uh, blood flow, and also another one, regional cerebral um, blood oxygenation, CBF or CBO. There are uh, two different uh, index that either way, if you can have a technique to probe. The CBO, it's okay. You, you may use this CBO to reflect whether there is a neural activity happens right now or not. Or you can measure the CBF to reflect the uh, neural activity. Either way, it's okay. So we say uh, normally the functional neural imaging will probe these two different things that based on the neurovascular coupling. So for the PET study, normally we use, we use the uh, oxygen 15 that actually is uh, probe these kind of things. But uh, uh, in FMI is more like this one. Okay, it's more like this one. But actually, it's more mixed way. We will talk, talk this point later. And now you may think about that since our brain will consume a lot, a lot of oxygen or a lot of glucose uh, in our brain once the neural activity happens, then will it cause any damage? Because it will consume so much uh, uh, oxygen. Actually, no. Our body will give a very huge amount of compensation. I mean, 
large amount of the supply about the uh, oxygen and the glucose to your brain. Even your brain may only need maybe 10% or 20% of them to generate the new activity. But actually, our body will give much more amount uh, blood supply to your brain to ensure that will, your brain won't uh, cause any damage because of the insufficient supply of the energy. So here is the uh, number that you can see right here. The CBF, you can see once we, we, are, we, we let the participant or the subject doing something in this gray area, in this gray period, maybe from 30 seconds to the 90 seconds right here, you can see uh, the blood flow will actually increase. You can see uh, the baseline is around 100%, right? And you can see that there is a peak value around uh, maybe 20%, and then comes down to around maybe uh, 107 or 80 percent right here. But you can see the oxygen uh, consumption right here. There is a, the, an index we call the CMRO2, the cerebral metabolic rate of oxygen right here. This is the major that we try to see uh, how large or what kind of the, uh, the, the, the demands for the oxygen uh, after the new activity. And you can see actually the CMRO2 will again increased uh, to maybe 120% level right here, but then it will comes down to maybe just three or four, 103 or 4% right here. So we can see there is a difference between these uh, two numbers right here. One is around seven or eight, and one is around maybe three or four. So actually our body will give more blood supply, more than the, your brain or your neural cell actually needs. So this is kind of the conversation and this kind of the insurance uh, mechanism that can ensure your brain will cause any damage just because the new activity happens and you don't have the sufficient blood supply. Okay. So combine these two things, actually the net oxygen uh, oxygenation uh, level will increase actually. Also the oxygen consumption increase, but because the uh, more supply is coming to your brain, the net oxygen level uh, is actually increased during the uh, neural activity. Okay. So finally, there are uh, three different properties that you should learn or you should know for the neural vascular coupling. Uh, we can uh, say there are three main properties. The first one is the time, and the second time is the space, and the final one is the amplitude. The first, uh, the first of all, I think you can take a look at, um, for this picture right here. If we say that there is a neuronal activity happens right here at maybe time zero right here, actually the duration for the uh, neuronal activity is maybe around uh, millisecond or two, maybe tens of the millisecond. It's pretty short, but you can see that the physical response, or we say the increase of the blood flow response right here, actually takes several seconds right here. So there is a time delay, and actually it's spend more time to finish one or single uh, neural activity event right here. So you can see this is the origin, but this is the response of the vessel. It's pretty different. So we, we are going to compare these two different kinds of events that you should learn about the time, about the space, about the amplitude. First of all, the time. Okay, you can see right here, uh, if the neural activity happens uh, at time zero, actually the physical resp response will happen, will initi initiate initiated after, I mean, one to two seconds. There is a time delay. So your physical response is not like a machine. It actually takes some time because the astrocyte or uh, uh, your neural cell need to send the message to the vessel, uh, vessel or the uh, smooth muscle need, uh, need some time to take the reaction, okay? So it actually delayed one to two seconds. So you can see, actually there is a one to two second delay right here. And then, after one to two second delay, you will see there is a physical response happens right here. But you will take, it will take around four to six seconds. You will see the peak value right here. So it is kind of a, a gradual or slow reaction. Uh, for the vascular response. It's not just like a, a click on and click off, not that fast. Actually, it takes a five to six seconds to uh, have the peak value right here. And then uh, coming back to the uh, baseline. 
Actually, they may have uh, you know the undershoot right here, but anyway, it just takes time. So overall, facial re response may take uh, 10 to 20 seconds to finish a uh, process right here, a uh, process of the neural activity. Okay, so we can say that the facial response because of the slow reaction of the smooth muscle cell uh, on the vessels, and also slow diffusion and uptake of the neurovascular mediators. It takes time to finish it or to initiate the uh, vascular response. So this is the very, very first thing you need to learn. Even you can only see the brain, uh, brain uh, activation, I mean, through the CB app or through the uh, blood flow or something. If it happens around five to six seconds after uh, the subject starting to do some motor task, you cannot say, Oh, uh, the subject's neuron actually works after five to six seconds. It's uh, really ri ridiculous. It's actually the uh, delay uh, comes from the vascular response. Okay. And the second thing, uh, second thing is the uh, space. Okay. The neural cell is uh, pretty small actually. However, uh, there is a mechanism we call vascular point spread function. PSF. PSF is kind of the uh, function that we uh, very often used in some kind of the mathematic calculation or something. But now we are talking about a vascular point spread function. That means once a neuron cell activates, actually it will induce the neighboring, I mean the vascular uh, surrounding this uh, neuron cell, it will activate the neighboring vessels to uh, have so-called vascular response. So these kind of things that actually spread out from one single point to the neighborhood. Okay, so we call this is the point spread function. So you can see actually this vascular PSF actually has a dimension around one to five millimeter. That means if you want to really measure the vascular response, you cannot really see in that detail because this kind of the uh, spread function can uh, reduce the spatial resolution, okay. And also, it uh, also depends on the image conditions or image techniques. For example, uh, the fMRI we are going to use in this semester actually um, can have the spatial resolution around maybe two millimeter or maybe as high as the one millimeter uh, at the most. So uh, for, for your record, actually, if you have a two millimeter cube, Faxos, Actually, it contains over you know a million neurons in within these voxels. So it's pretty hard to say that this kind of the task uh, or well, induce a uh, neural activation. It's pretty hard to say. It's actually kind of a regional activation. Okay. And also, there is another number for your reference that you can uh, say actually uh, for the gray matter, the density is the network of the capillaries. Okay, the blood uh, vessels right here, actually they have the interfacial distance of about uh, 25 micrometer. Okay, this is another number you can memorize. And the final one is the amplitude. So remember that uh, normally or in general, the amplitude of vascular coupling, that means the vascular response, uh, appears to be a uh, linear, linear process. That means if you have uh, neural activity in the time zero, and then you may have an activity around maybe time uh, four seconds or something, the activation or the vascular response will add up, add up, just like a linear process, it will add up. The uh, amplitude will become larger and larger following a linear relationship. However, because we say that the vascular response is a pretty slow reaction, so actually there is a, a, a uh, and limitation that normally the stimulus duration should be larger than four seconds. If the sti stimulus uh, stimuli becomes too close, that means we see in four seconds, the vascular response may, uh, may, may become kind of a nonlinear because it is not react so fast and it may become, uh, may, may come into a saturated state right there. So be careful that you are, if you are going to design an fMRI study, is, is that really um, suitable or is that really proper that you induce uh, too intense, too intense that stimuli to your uh, subjects? It may cause some effects we call the nonlinear effects. 
for uh, some kind of a study we call the block design, uh, actually this kind of a linear relationship is not important. But for some kind of event related study, actually linear relationship is pretty important. We'll talk about the experimental design in the next week, but I'm just trying to give you a head up that uh, linear ship is uh, something uh, you need to keep in mind. If you want to really see a very good linear relationship, keep your stimuli just has four second, at least a four second interval between each others. Okay. So finally, I want to uh, just remind you that this kind of a neurovascular coupling may sometimes you know, just break down or not not that true uh, for these three different situations. For example, in a disease state. If there is some di a disease that can cause the vascular response change, then if you are using the fMI to probe the vascular response and you, you cannot see very strong activation, you cannot say the patient don't, uh, doesn't have a strong neural activity. You cannot say so because the uh, neurovascular response already be uh, changed, already be altered because of the disease state. So if you are facing some disease that may alter the dynamics of the vascular system, you need to be very, very careful. For example, the hypertension, the diabetes, or even some ADs may alter the ion channels. Then you need to watch out the vascular response. It may be very, very different. Another thing is the aging. Defin definitely aging will change your vascular system. So the flexibility, the smooth muscle function uh, of your vessels. And also we say that it may change the structure of your blood vessels. So definitely aging is another issue. So if you want to uh, observe or investigate the uh, elder people uh, brain activation, do not compare their brain activation directly uh, to the healthy controls or young, younger healthy controls. It's not a fair because the age can cause the different vascular response. So you definitely need the so-called age-matched, age-matched uh, control groups to really say, uh, to really say that maybe the brain function is, uh, is reduced in this kind of the population, okay? And finally, you can see that if you are uh, taking some medicine or drugs like the vasodilator, it definitely can change the vascular response, okay? So just watch out that even the uh, hypercap uh, hypercapnia, this is kind of the state that uh, there is a, a high concentration of the CO2 in your blood. It will naturally uh, just let your body to have kind of a rea reaction, so-called vasodilation, to reduce this kind of a CO2, okay? So there are several different things that may change the coupling state, I mean the neuropathic coupling. So be very careful when you are studying the patient, of course, most of the patients are taking some medicines. And it, they are, most of the aging people are taking some medicines. So this point, you need to memorize that before you are saying that you find out something using the FMI, or find out something based on the neurovascular coupling, just memorize these few points, okay? 